Hey everyone. All right, so in this video, we're going to wrap up a Taylor series. So if you remember last time, uh, we started up on these and we found the Taylor series representations for a number of functions. And we actually ended off with uh, my showing you a collection of, I think, five functions, who, which we'll consider to be kind of fundamental in a sense, and which I asked you guys to uh, commit to memory because we can actually leverage those to help us find the Taylor series of composite functions. So uh, as a reminder, here is the full list. So here are our five functions, one over one minus x, e to the x, sine and cosine, and arctan. Uh, so something I did not mention last time, which I should have, which is also be sure you uh, remember what the radius and intervals of convergence are. So those are also important to know. Um, I don't think they're too difficult to get down. Um, three of them are just radius of uh, radius of convergence infinity, which means the interval of convergence is just all the real numbers, and the other two are just minus one to one. One of them is open, the other is closed. So not too bad, I think. Uh, but at any rate, this is what you need to memorize. I'll leave it on screen for a second uh, so you can pause the video and uh, refamiliarize yourselves with it if you need to. But uh, this is what we're going to be using for the remainder of this section. All right, so, so what are we really going to be doing then? So let me start off with... In, so let me, let me go ahead and show the first example real quick, which will make it easier to explain what it is we'll be doing. So example one, uh, the task is to find the Maclaurin series, in other words, Taylor series centered at x equals zero, find the Maclaurin series and radius of convergence, I guess I'll call that rad of con, that sounds radical. Uh, find the Maclaurin series and radius of convergence of this function, f of x equals x times the sine of 5x cubed over 2. Uh, so quick note, um, if you have a, a very early version of my notes, uh, there was a typo here in defining this expression. So I think there was like a 4 and a 3 or something. But anyway, this is what I meant. It's been updated online now. If you grab my notes online now, everything's fine. Uh, but anyway, this is what we want to do. We want to find the Maclaurin series and radius of convergence of this thing. And the idea is we want to make use of the series we've already got in order to generate it. So we don't want to generate it from scratch. We don't want to compute 700 derivatives of this and try to find a pattern. Uh, so last time, I think we already did that a little bit, but I think we focused primarily on manipulating uh, just e to the x and 1 over 1 minus x. Uh, but we can... But now uh, we can make use of this full zoo of fundamental Taylor series to get where we need to go. Uh, so how do we do it in this case? Well, so one thing I note to start is um, in this function definition, uh, sine is very prominent in here, which makes me think the sine Taylor series is probably important. Uh, so let's remind ourselves what that is. So the sine Taylor series says that you can write sine of x as x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial, and so on. You have odd powers of x, and you divide by odd factorials, and you're alternating. So that's the main pattern to remember. And based on that, um, you can go and construct this series representation, or this uh, sigma sum representation for this series. Uh, we can write it out as sigma sum, n equals 0 to infinity, of minus 1 to the n, times x to the 2n plus 1, that's how we represent an, an, the uh, nth odd number, uh, divided by 2n plus 1 factorial. All right, so that is however you want to write it. That is the Taylor series expansion for sine of x. Uh, so in our case, we have uh, this expression, not just plain vanilla sine of x, but we have x times sine of 5x cubed over 2. Uh, but uh, this is no real... but. But this is no real obstacle to using this Taylor series, because remember, just like with partial fractions and all of those, this is an equation that holds for all x. And in the case of uh, in the case of sine and also cosine and e to the x, it actually holds for all x 
that are in the range from minus infinity to infinity. So for all real numbers, no restrictions, radius of convergence is infinite. So what that means is, um, in order to, uh, what that means is we can plug in anything, any real number we want in for x, and this will work out. So in order to get a formula for this, I'm going to plug in the entire complicated expression, 5x cubed over 2, that entire thing, plug it in for x, and see what we get. So in that case, sine of 5x cubed over 2, I think I'm going to operate on the sigma sum, that's a bit more compact. So we get negative 1 to the n, and in place of x, I'm going to put this uh, piece of garbage. So I'll write it as 5x cubed over 2, like that, to the power 2n plus 1, all divided by 2n plus 1, factorial. All right, so that's fine. So we want to get a power series representation, right? So a Taylor series is a power series, so we need to make this thing look more power series-esque. So what that means is I want to have all of the coefficients, the coefficient sequence c sub n, on, all on the left as coefficients, and I want to have powers of x on the right side. So to get there, we'll just go and distribute this exponent through. So I have minus 1 to the n times... I'll distribute it to every factor. So I'll have 5 to the 2n plus 1, and then I'll have x cubed to the power of 2n plus 1. So an exponent, or rather a power to a power. Uh, what happens? The exponents multiply. So I have 3 times the quantity 2n plus 1. So that will give me, I think, 6n plus 3 for the x. And last of all, I'll distribute this to the over 2, but I think I'm going to put everything under a single denominator. So I'm just going to copy-paste the 2n plus 1 factorial, and I'll put this thing 2 to the power 2n plus 1 uh, downstairs with it. All right, and I think now we have uh, turned this pretty much into a power series. I mean, yeah, I guess you could drag the x um, outside of the fraction if you really, really want to make it look power series-like, but uh, uh, no reasonable person, I think, would fail to see this as being a power series at this point. All right, so very good, um, although we're not quite there yet because there, we also need to multiply by an x in order to have uh, the original function that we wanted. So we have uh, almost the original function. We have the original function, except we don't have this x. So in order to put that in, I will just multiply all sides by x. So, all right, I guess I'll put it inside the series. I'll put an x there and put another x there. So multiply all sides by x. And uh, let's simplify it through a bit. So here I have a power of x times another x, so I can absorb those if I increase the exponent on this guy. So turn this into 6n plus 4. And I think we have what we're after. So there is our Taylor series for x times the sine of 5x cubed over 2, or the Maclaurin series. All right, but we also need to find the radius of convergence. So we could do that by uh, doing the ratio test on this thing. Uh, but again, uh, that looks pretty darn nasty. And again, the whole, full, the whole idea here is we wanted to go and leverage these, or specifically this one, in order to find what the uh, to find out everything we need to know. So both what the series expansion looks like and its radius of convergence. Uh, so can we do that? Uh, so I think yes, we can. All right, so how do we do it then? So so what, so as a reminder, what we're after here, in order to find the radius of convergence, uh, what, we're, what we're really asking is what are all of the x values here uh, what what are, what is the full set or interval of x values that result in this series being convergent? That's what we're asking. Well, um, if we go back a few steps, we remember that this expression for sine of x, however you want to write it, uh, this works for all x uh, from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, so in place of x, what we put was um, this rather complicated expression right here, 5x cubed over 2. So... Based on this knowledge, um, this works for all x that are in between that, so therefore plugging this thing in will work as long as... So, so this thing will converge 
if and only if. The expression we actually plugged in, which was 5x cubed over 2, if that thing is in the interval from minus infinity to infinity. So, so that's, so that's the question. Um, is, is 5x cubed over 2 in the interval from minus infinity to infinity? And that seems like a bit of a weird question because the answer is, well, yeah, it is. Um, if you cube something, multiply it by 5 and divide by 2, uh, you're going to be a real number. And it doesn't matter what real number x you started with. You can pick any real number x you want. If I cube it, multiply by 5, and divide by 2, I remain a real number. Um, a different real number, but it will still be a real number. So what that tells me then is this expansion does indeed work for all real x. Which means the radius of convergence is infinite. All right, so that is our first example. All right, so let's do another one, uh, but this time with uh, well, a, a bit of a different angle to it. So instead of just trying to find a series representation, uh, we're going to do that, uh, but then we're going to use it for something. So example two, what we want to do is we want to evaluate a certain indefinite integral, this one, the integral of cosine of x to the power 6 dx, we're going to find that as an infinite series. So instead of finding a, a kind of regular closed form uh, expression for what this integral is, which uh, may be difficult and or which may be difficult or impossible, um, we're just going to content ourselves with getting a series representation for this integral. All right, so all right, so remember the whole one of the great advantages of Taylor series and representing functions as power series is it gives us a way to write um, a potentially complicated function like this one is uh, basically as a polynomial, which is something very easy to manipulate. Um, in particular, a polynomial is pretty trivially easy to integrate and differentiate. All right, so in order to integrate this thing, we're going to turn cosine of x into a series. So that's step one. All right, so let's just focus on that side of it then. So we want to write this thing out as a series. Uh, well, this thing very uh, very strongly suggests that uh, we should piggyback on the uh, Taylor series expansion for just plain vanilla cosine of x. So let's remind ourselves what that was. So uh, where do I want to write it? Uh, I think I'll, I'm going to make it steal the spot that I just put that one in. So let me go and write our reminder over here. So cosine of x, its Taylor expansion was 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial and so on. Which, if you were to write it out in sigma fashion, would result in sigma sum n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the n times x to the 2n divided by 2n factorial. So this is again capturing the pattern here, which is we get only even powers of x and divide by even factorials. And that is captured in this expression because 2n is always an even number. It represents the nth even number. All right, so that is our fundamental Taylor series. So if I want to get one for cosine of x to the sixth, well, I can just plug in x to the sixth, right? So I get cosine x to the sixth. So every copy of x in this expression, well, there's only one, uh, turns into an x to the sixth. So we get sigma sum n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the sixth itself to the two n divided by two n factorial, which if we combine the exponents gives us minus 1 to the n times x to the 12n divided by 2n factorial. All right, so 
right? So we have a series representation now for cosine of x to the sixth, which should hopefully uh, make this integral, which is what we actually want, much easier to find, because we've what we've basically got here is just an infinitely long polynomial, which, like a polynomial, should be very easy to integrate. And we've already done a few exercises with that before, I think, last video. So, all right, let's go and do it now. So we have cosine x to the sixth dx. That is going to be the integral of this infinite series. Sigma sum minus 1 to the n, x to the 12n over 2n factorial dx. All right, and the nice thing that happens is an integral uh, behaves nicely with a sigma sum. Um, or with addition in general. So we have an integral of a sum, so the result is going to be the sum of the integrals. I can apply the integral independently on each term of the series. And so what we're going to wind up with is, well, let me not forget, I'm taking the integral, so I need to have a c. I, it's customary to put it at the beginning when you're dealing with series. So I'll have c plus sigma sum n equals zero to infinity of the integral of this thing. And again, what we're, what we're doing here is we're going to treat n as a constant as far as the integral is concerned, because the integral is integrating with respect to x. So n is just a constant as far as it's concerned. So what we get then is going to be negative 1 to the n, x to the 12n plus 1, that's the power rule in action, divided by 2n factorial, and the second half of the power rule tells me I have to divide by my new updated exponent. All right, so there we go. And I think we've got what we wanted. So there we go. A power series representation of cosine of x to the sixth. Oh, I'm sorry, you couldn't even see that. Nice to see some things never change. Like we can go and switch to an online format and I still forget to go and scroll the page. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so what we've done in this example is we used Taylor series to help us uh, do integration, uh, but Taylor series, uh, like I said, uh, they can be used to help with a number of different kinds of tasks. So integration is one of them. Uh, taking a derivative is another, uh, but that's not the limits of what it can do. Uh, the other thing that it can help us with is limits. I'm sure you're all laughing as much as I'm imagining you are. All right, so yes, so Taylor series can help us in evaluating some complicated limits. So for example, this one. So what we're going to try to find here is, or what we're going to do here is we're going to take the limit as, not as n goes to infinity, yeah, excuse me, the limit as x goes to zero of arctangent of 2x minus 2x divided by x cubed. So that's the task. So in this case, uh, you might be able to uh, get away with this using uh, L'Hopital's rule, uh, but we're going to tackle this with series in this case, which in some ways might be, uh, well, I mean, I don't know, uh, it might be a bit easier depending on your disposition, I guess. Um, at any rate, it would be pretty essential if you forgot what the derivative of arctan was, uh, but you happen to remember the Taylor series expansion for arctan. Uh, in any case, um, we're, we're going to tackle it using series. So I need to get a series representation for this thing that I'm taking a limit of. Uh, well, um, both x cubed and minus 2x are themselves polynomials, so they're kind of trivially uh, power series already. They're finite power series, polynomials. Uh, so, so the only thing I need to do is write arctangent of 2x as a power series, or a Taylor series. All right, well, the component here in question is arctan, so I'm probably going to need that fundamental Taylor series. So as a reminder, um, if you want to write arctangent of x as a Taylor series centered at zero, a Maclaurin series, uh, it looks like this. We have x minus x cubed over 3, plus x to the fifth over five, minus x to the seven over seven, and so on. 
uh, it's just the odd powers of x divided by odd numbers. And so it resembles the formula for sine of x, except there's no factorials. It's just 3, 5, and 7, not 3 factorial, 5 factorial, or any of the others. <clears throat> Alright, so... In that case, if we have arctangent of 2x, we can obtain that if I just plug in 2x into all of these. So plugging that in, I'm going to get 2x minus uh, 2x quantity cubed, which is 2 cubed x cubed over 3. And then plus, I think, 2 to the 5th, x to the 5th over 5, and so on. I think I'm not going to write the, that next term out. <laughs> Alright, so there we go. So now let's put this back into context with this limit expression. So in that case, arctan 2x minus 2x divided by x cubed can be written out as 2x minus 2 cubed x cubed over 3 plus 2 to the 5th, x to the 5th, over 5, and so on. But at the end of all of that, uh, we're going to subtract off an additional 2x, and then divide by x cubed. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's see if this helps us out any. So let's see if we can simplify anything out. And I think the answer is yes. So we have over here a 2x as my starting term for the arctangent of 2x series, which will happily cancel with this minus 2x. And so what we're going to be left with then is just negative 2 cubed x cubed over 3 plus 2 to the 5th, x to the 5th over 5, and then whatever comes after that. And we're going to divide all of this by x cubed, which I'm going to render in this case as multiply by 1 over x cubed. All right, but then we can do even more simplification. So we have over here an x cubed, the next one is an x to the 5th, the next one after that would be an x to the 7, and we would only get higher order powers of x from there. So they all, in particular, have a common factor of x cubed. So this x cubed will cancel with this x cubed and will partially cancel with all of the rest of them. So then what we're going to be left with is negative 2 cubed over 3 plus 2 to the 5th times, I think, x squared over 5 and then minus a bunch of higher order terms. All right, so I think we've simplified it about as much as we can. So now let's get back to the original question, is we want to take the limit as x goes to 0. And so the trouble was, with something like this, um, uh, we couldn't do it directly because if we plug it in, well, we're going to have division by 0. And I think on top we're going to have 0 minus 0. So we couldn't plug it in directly there. But now that we've done all of this simplification, which again was possible thanks to writing everything out as a Taylor, or writing out arctangent of 2x as a Taylor series, now that we've gotten this simplification down here, I think we can actually just directly plug in x. So, uh, so remember, we're taking the limit as x goes to 0. So if I plug in x equals 0 into this, then all of the higher order terms are just going to vanish, right? Because every higher order term, every term except this one right here, which is a constant, contains some power of x in it. And so if I take x equals 0, then all of these terms are just going to vanish. And so the only thing that survives is a negative 2 cubed over 3, or in other words, a negative 8 thirds. Which is, in this case, our limit. All right, I've got a similar kind of limit question for you here. So we're taking the limit as x goes to 0 again. Uh, but this time of 1 minus cosine of 3x divided by e to the x minus 1 minus x. All right, so, so uh, just like before, we're going to try to evaluate this using Taylor series. So in that case, I need to write out everything I can as a series. So in this case, it looks like there's two main pieces I need to write as a series this time. I have a cosine of 3x, which I should turn into a series, and I have e to the x, which I need to turn into a series. All right, so let's remind ourselves what the expansions for those were. So a cosine of x, I think we did that not too long ago. 
that was sigma sum and equals, well actually no, I don't want to use sigma sum in this case. I want to actually write them out explicitly. So a 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on. And e to the x can be written out as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. All right, so uh, this substitution with e to the x I can do directly. Uh, for cosine of x, I'll need to substitute in 3x, but uh, I think we can go ahead and take care of that in one motion. So let me write this out over here. 1 minus cosine of 3x divided by e to the x minus 1 minus x. So, all right, I'll start with the numerator. Let's uh, tackle the high-hanging fruit first in this case. So we'll have 1 minus this series. So I'm subtracting this series. So what that means is all of the signs are going to flip in this case. So I'm going to have a minus 1 and then plus, and in place of x squared, I'm going to put 3x quantity squared, which will turn into 3 squared x squared over 2 factorial, and then minus 3 to the fourth x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and then so on. And downstairs, what do we have? Uh, well, we just have plain old e to the x power series, so that's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. And from this entire series, we're going to subtract off 1 and subtract off x. All right, so let's see if this pays us, uh, pays us any dividends or not. So let's see, does anything cancel or simplify? Uh, okay, well, a little thing uh, simplifies here. We have 1 minus 1, so those will cancel and disappear. And what else have we got? Uh, we have a 1 and a negative 1, and an x and a negative x. So this will evidently cancel with the first two terms of the expansion for e to the x. So what is that going to leave us with then? So on top, I think it's going to leave us with 3 squared x squared over 2 factorial minus 3 to the fourth x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on. And down below, we're going to have just, I think, just x squared over 2 factorial plus uh, x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on from there. All right, well, so that seems to help a little bit, although I still can't plug in for x yet, right? So I'm taking the limit as x goes to 0. So I would like to, at some stage, just plug in 0 in for x. Uh, I don't think that stage is now, because if I try, I'm going to have... Uh, if I plug in 0 into all of the terms in the numerator, they're all going to turn into zeros, and so I'm going to get 0 on top, and the exact same thing happens in the denominator. So I can't uh, do that yet. But I'm getting a 0 over 0, which kind of makes me think that there should still be some cancellation to be done. And is there? So I think, yeah, um, if I look over here, uh, we start off in the numerator with an x squared uh, term, and then all of the ones after it are higher order. And same thing down here. In the denominator, we start off with an x squared, and all of the other terms are higher order. So what that means is there is a common factor of x squared in all of the terms in both numerator and denominator, which means that I can factor them out and cancel them. So ultimately, what that means is I can go and divide both numerator and denominator by x squared to cancel away all of the square, uh, all the squared x's. That's the common factor. Uh, so once I do that, what am I going to be left with? Well, I'm going to have 3 squared over 2 factorial as a constant minus 3 to the fourth x squared over 4 factorial over there and then plus some more stuff, whatever it is. And down here, we're going to have just 1 over 2 factorial, plus, I think, x over 3 factorial, and it just keeps on going from there. All right, so now I'll ask the question again, can we plug in something for x now? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. Or, I'm sorry, plug in x equals 0 now. And so I think the answer is yes, right? So if I plug in 0 now, then this term and all of the higher order terms, which just contain higher powers of x, are all going to vanish. And the same thing down here, x over 3 factorial is going to cancel away along with all of the other ones. And so all that we're going to be left with then in the limit as x goes to 0 is 3 squared over 2 factorial divided by 1 over 2 factorial. And the 2 factorials are going to cancel. And so all that we're going to be left with is just 3 squared, or in other words, 9. So there we have it. There is our limit. All right, so we've done now a couple of applications of Taylor series two limits. So now let's go back to, well, not really go back. So this is a, another example kind of like uh, the integral one we just did, but this time it's going to be a definite integral. So example five, what we want to do is we want to compute this integral, definite integral, the integral from zero to one of e to the minus x squared dx. We'll compute it, but as an infinite series. All right, so this one is a pretty good example in a lot of ways because uh, e to the minus x squared is kind of a classic example of an integrand which you cannot find an antiderivative of. Um, or at least you can't find one written in terms of ordinary functions like plus, minus, times, divide, powers, roots, sine, cosine, ln, all of those things. You cannot write the antiderivative of e to the minus x squared in terms of any of those. It's, uh, for all intents and purposes, it, uh, it's unwritable. Uh, it exists, but you can't write it out, so don't even try. So in that case, if we wanted to find out something like this, how are we going to do it? Well, so the answer is, again, Taylor series to save the day. Um, we can't get a nice closed form uh, answer for this, or at least not necessarily, but we can get a series representation which will let us approximate it uh, to as many decimal points as you care. All right, so to tackle this, we need to write out the integrand as, in, in, as a power series so that it's now easy to integrate. So the task at hand then is to write e to the negative x squared as a power series somehow. And uh, while this thing is definitely uh, matching against the e to the x power series, so uh, again, as a reminder, the e to the x power series, or Taylor series, is sigma sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So what that means in this case, we just plug in negative x squared in for all, uh, this copy of x. And so we're just going to have negative x squared to the power n divided by n factorial, uh, which we can make look more power series-esque if I go and distribute the exponent through, so to speak. So I think I'm going to get a minus 1 to the n out in front, and then x to the 2n divided by n factorial. All right, so this is the thing we're going to integrate. <clears throat> so let's bring it down here. So in that case, integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x squared dx can be written out as integral of the sigma sum of negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n, divided by n factorial, uh, dx. <clears throat> Alright, and so just like before, we can operate on each individual term of the series independently. So this definite integral is going to just become sigma sum n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1, divided by n factorial times 2n plus 1. So that's the power rule at work. Uh, but this is a definite integral in this case. So this is the antiderivative. So we know what to do in order to get the definite integral. 
we will just go and evaluate the bounds at the two endpoints and subtract. So in this case, the endpoints are x equals 0 and 1. All right, so we'll plug in the top one first. So in that case, I'm going to have sigma sum of... Well, okay, so let's see. If I plug in 1, then I'm just going to have 1 to the power 2n plus 1. But 1 raised to any power is just 1, so I don't actually... So I can actually just eliminate this factor completely from the expression. So I'm just going to have left negative 1 to the n divided by n factorial times 2n plus 1. All right, so that's the result of plugging in x equals 1. If I now plug in x equals 0, which is what I'm supposed to subtract, what's going to happen? Well, if I plug in x equals 0, then I'm just going to have 0 to a power, which is 0, which is just going to annihilate everything. So apparently, if I plug in 0, I'm just going to get a big fat minus 0. So I don't even need to write that. All right, so evidently, we are done. This is a series representation of this integral. All right, uh, but there is a second part to this, which I'll call example six, but it's really not an independent example. Uh, let's find out how good this, um, this uh, series representation is. So we'll do something pretty darn modest. Let's say that we add up four terms of this series, and let's estimate the error in that approximation. Estimate the error in using four terms. All right, so we're going to add up four terms. So in this case, we have to be a, a little careful here about what I mean by four terms. So this is a series that starts at n equals zero. So zero is actually the first term. So if we're adding up the four terms, or adding up the first four terms, that really corresponds to me adding up n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3. So 3 is the highest order index I'm going to have here. So really then, what I'm wanting to estimate is the remainder of R3. So R3, because my final index is n equals 3, because we're starting at 0 and we're adding up four terms. All right, so how am I going to estimate this? Well, um, I think we can see one way to do it, right? So this is an alternating series. We have negative 1 to the n, and the terms are decreasing. If I plug in bigger and bigger values of n, this is going to cause uh, the thing inside of the sigma sum to get smaller and smaller, closer to 0. So indeed, the alternating series test applies, and therefore also... Uh, does the estimation, uh, the remainder estimation theorem as well. So what does it tell us, uh, tell us then? Uh, so it says if you want to estimate the remainder after stopping at n equals 3, then what you need to do is bound it by the magnitude of the first forsaken term. So the first forsaken term is b4. So... <clears throat> So as a reminder, what I mean by b sub 4 is uh, I'm referring by b to the non-alternating version of the terms. So b4 corresponds to 1 without the negative 1 alternating stuff. Uh, 1 divided by 4 factorial times uh, 2 times 4, which is 8, plus 1. So I think that's a 9. All right, and I think if you compute that, you get that this is 1 over 216. And so that is our error. And uh, if you're kind of curious as to what this is, what its decimal expansion look like, it uh, looks like, it is approximately 0 0.0046. So it looks like we get within a hundredth, at least. So not quite three decimal places, but it looks like we basically get two decimal places, which is pretty good. Um, that's useful for a lot of purposes, and we just needed to add up a measly four terms, which is not very much. A computer could do it in a snap. All right, so now we're going to turn to the last kind of subtopic in this section about uh, Taylor series uh, with a sequence of examples here. Uh, which are going to be kind of, again, kind of a reverse 
order of what we've been doing before. So we've been getting like series representations of explicit functions, but now we're going to go the other way around and try to find uh, the sum of some series uh, written in a closed form. So not at, not written as an infinite series, but we want to turn infinite series into closed form algebraic expressions again. So in other words, we want to find the sum of series. And we're going to use Taylor series to help us out. All right, so maybe this will be a bit clearer if I write down one of the examples we're going to be looking at. So example seven, uh, which is going to be multi-part. Uh, the task at hand is to find the sums of the following series. And the first one we're going to start off with is sigma sum n equals zero to infinity of this thing. So negative one to the n times pi to the two n plus one divided by six to the two n plus one times two n plus one factorial. All right, so that looks a bit of a nightmare. Uh, but it should look like a familiar kind of nightmare. Um, so kind of the strategy with these is we're going to try to match the structure of the series we're given with one of the standard uh, series formulas for, or one, one of the standard Taylor series that we've got. So in this case, if I look at this, um, well, one thing that stands out a lot is I have a lot of 2n plus 1s, and in particular, we have a 2n plus 1 as a factorial. And remember, 2n plus 1 is kind of an alias for odd number. So there were two series that involved having odd numbers. Uh, I think they were sine of x and arctan, right? Uh, but only one of them had a factorial attached to the odd number, and that one was sine of x. And so indeed, if I go and reference this real quick, uh, we see, yeah, sine of x has 2n plus 1 factorial, and it has a 2n plus 1 exponent as well. Uh, it's also alternating. We have a minus 1 to the n, and yeah, and indeed, we have that there too. So this thing seems to strongly resemble the Taylor series form of sine of x. So let's see if we can make use of it then. So uh, one thing to note here is what we've written down here is a concrete series. So this is not a, uh, well, what you what you might typically think of as a Taylor series or a power series, uh, because it doesn't have an x in it. So this is an actual concrete series. This thing evaluates to some sort of number. Uh, if you want to think about it this way, this is a power series where we've plugged in something in for x. And in fact, that is going to be kind of the key point here. Uh, we should think of this thing as being the power series of sine of x where we've plugged something in for x. And the question is, what did we plug in for x in order to generate that series popping out? All right, well, to make it a little more clear, if you haven't caught on yet, some of you may already see where this is going. Uh, but let me go and kind of combine the exponent stuff. So remember the expansion for sine of x, maybe I should copy it out real quick. Uh, sine of x was sigma sum n equals zero to infinity minus one to the n x to the two n plus one divided by two n plus one factorial. So this expression has only a has a two n plus one in the exponent, but it's only the exponent of a single thing. It's the exponent of whatever x is, and remember that's what we're hunting for here. So over here, I have 2n plus 1 showing up in the exponent in two places, but uh, there's an exponent rule which tells me, hey, if you have two different bases, but they have the same exponent, you can combine them. So let me do that and see what we get. So if I combine these, then I'm going to have negative 1 to the n times pi over 6 to the power 2n plus 1, which I'll just put up here in the numerator, uh, divided by... 2n plus 1 factorial. And now I think you can see how these two correspond. They correspond very closely. In fact, it looks like all we did from this series to this series is we plugged in pi over 6 in for x. So evidently then, 
this series is the same. So this we get this series if we plug in pi over 6 into the Taylor expansion of sine of x. But Taylor expansion of sine of x equals sine of x. They're the same thing. It's just a representation. So therefore, this series must be sine of pi over 6, which, if my trig knowledge doesn't fail me now, is 1 half. All right, so there we go. We found the sum of the series by take by pattern matching it against the Taylor formula, the Taylor series formula for sine of x. We figured out that we get this series if we plug in x equals pi over 6 into the Taylor series formula for sine of x. All right, so you get the idea of what we're doing. All right, so in that case, let's go and do another example. So in this case, we want to, again, find the actual sum of a series. Uh, in this case, it is a sigma sum, n equals 0 to infinity, of 3 times negative 1 to the n times x to the 5n, uh, divided by n factorial. All right, so in this case, uh, we don't have a concrete series, so to speak. Uh, we actually have an x showing up, uh, but that doesn't really make it, uh, any difference. It just means our final answer uh, won't be a concrete specific number. It'll be some expression involving x. All right, that's fine, uh, but the same process still applies. Uh, we want to find the sum of the series, write out an algebraic formula for it. Uh, so we need to uh, be able to match this series with some series whose sum we know in advance. And uh, those series are the ones uh, from that table, that table of standard Taylor series. So in this case, what do what features do we see here that are prominent? So in this case, I don't see anything like 2n plus 1 or even 2n. Uh, in this case, it looks like we just have a lone n factorial. And I think there is only one series in our list that actually just had n factorial all by itself, and that was e to the x. So it looks to me like this one, like the, our target function, should be e to the x in this case. And if I write out the formula, or the Taylor series formula for it, um, that was x to the n divided by n factorial. And so again, the question is, assuming this choice of template series is correct, we need to figure out what is it that we need, uh, what x value do we need to plug in for this formula that we generate, uh, so, so that we generate this series. Well, okay, maybe I shouldn't say x equals, because actually the thing that we need to plug in for x itself is an expression in terms of x, but uh, let me write it like this. Substitute what? For x in order to get this. All right, well, I would like to make this series match up with the form of this series a bit more closely. So I already have the n factorial on bottom, uh, but I don't have the other thing. So I have a 5n and I have an n. So I'd like to condense everything so that I have just a single exponent of n. Uh, well, I should be able to do that using a similar trick before, right? Because here we have an n, this one is a 5n, but they're still fairly similar. Uh, we should be able to combine them somehow. So I think we can do it, uh, but I'll have to take a detour for one extra exponent rule. So let me write x to the 5n as x to the power 5 itself to the nth power. All right, so once I do that, now we have a common exponent in these two factors, and so I can combine them. So I'm left with 3 times negative x to the fifth to the power n, all over n factorial. All right, so now I'm a lot closer to this. Um, in fact, I'm almost there. The only thing gumming it up is I have this constant 3, and I don't think there's any real easy way to put an exponent with an n there. Uh, but I think that would be overkill, right? Because we have just a constant multiple here as part of a series. So we have three times something plus three times another thing plus three times another thing after that. Well, we can just factor out the three. 
3 is a common factor in all of the terms, so let's factor it all the way out of the entire sigma sum. All right, and at this point, I think we see what, I think we have what we want. So ignoring the three, which is on the outside now, uh, we have this, uh, this formula matching up with this one very closely. And it looks like the thing that we needed to substitute in for x is negative x to the fifth. All right, so uh, doing that substitution to both of these, we get that this entire series can be rewritten as 3, which is again just hanging out on the outside, times e to the negative x to the fifth. And I think that does it. Okay, so I have one last uh, one last uh, series as part of this example for you guys. And that is this one. So we have sigma sum, n equals 0 to infinity, of negative 4 to the power n times pi to the 2n divided by 9 to the n times 2n factorial. All right, so again, we need to find a series, a Taylor series, to match this up with. Uh, so a good way to tell that, if you haven't caught on already, is to take a look at whatever thing has a factorial next to it. So in this case, we have a 2n factorial. Uh, so in that case, that strongly suggests the cosine function, I think. That's the only function in our list that has a 2n factorial in it. And writing out its formula, it is negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n divided by 2n factorial. All right, so like before, we need to find some way to transform this series so that it looks a lot like this series, because that will tell us what we need to plug in for x, and hence cosine, in order to evaluate the sum of this series. All right, well, the key features here that are lacking from this guy so we have the 2n factorial, that's already taken care of, we don't need to do anything there. Uh, but we need a negative 1 to the n, and instead we have a negative 4 to the n, so that's wrong and that needs fixing. Uh, pi to the 2n, alright, that looks good, but downstairs we have just 9 to the n. We would like that to be 2n, uh, something to the power 2n, so we can combine it with the pi to the 2n, so we can just have a single base to the power 2n and match it up with this template a little better. So it looks like those are the two things we need to fix. Uh, so I'll do them in the order I mentioned them. So first, how do we go and get a negative 1 to the n in place of a negative 4 to the n? Well, one way to do it is you can think of the negative as being just another factor. It's a factor of negative 1. So let me go and distribute the n to both of these pieces. So in that case, I'm going to have negative 1 to the n times 4 to the n times pi to the 2n divided by 9 to the n times 2n factorial, I think. Yep. All right, so now I've got my minus 1 to the n, uh, but I still have the problem of getting, uh, getting all of my exponents to have two n's in them. And in this case, it looks like I made my life even more worse because... Uh, I had originally just 9 to the n, which I needed to turn into something to the 2n. Now I also have 4 to the n, which needs that done as well. So how can we do that? Well, one thing you might have already noticed is both 4 and 9 are actually perfect squares in this case. Um, 4 is 2 squared, 9 is 3 squared. So what happens if I go and write them out more explicitly? So 4 becomes... 2 squared itself to the n power, pi to the 2n, and down below we have 3 squared to the power n times 2n factorial. And now that I've written out the squares more explicitly, let me go and use the exponent rule to go and combine 
uh, to go and multiply these two exponents. And I think that will give us what we want. So I have negative 1 to the n times 2 to the 2n times pi to the 2n divided by 3 to the 2n times 2n factorial. Now, every factor, uh, aside from the negative 1 and the 2n factorial, which are already taken care of, everything else has an exponent of 2n, and so we can combine them to all together into one big power. Negative 1 to the n times, and I just merge all the bases together, so I think I get 2 pi divided by 3 to the 2n power, all over 2n factorial. And now I think we have matched up um, this series with this one. So this series is what we get from plugging in x equals 2 pi over 3. So in that case, this series must evaluate to whatever cosine of 2 pi over 3 is. Which, uh, don't fail me now, trig knowledge, I think is a negative 1 half. All right, I've got one last topic to cover in the set of notes, and that is Taylor polynomials. Uh, so this, this one should be pretty brief. Um, if you already feel decently comfortable-ish with Taylor series, uh, then you should find these to be pretty, uh, pretty doable. Uh, so what is a Taylor polynomial? Well, it's just a truncated Taylor series, so that's pretty much all there is to it. So a Taylor polynomial is a truncated Taylor series, or in other words, a partial sum of a Taylor series. So instead of adding up the series from n equals 0 to infinity, you stop at some end point, some capital N. Uh, well, in which case, then, it's not an equation, it's actually an approximation. So uh, if you stop at a certain point, you get an approximate, uh, an approximation of the function f at whatever center point you're at. So you stop at some uh, finite number n, and the formula is the same. So it's the nth derivative of f at a, divided by n factorial times x minus a to the power n. Which looks like, again, more explicitly, f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared, and so on all the way up to the capital nth derivative. Uh, I'm going to run out of room. Ugh, maybe that just barely works. All right, so uh, when we're considering uh, uh, one of these, so in this case, uh, we have, this is a Taylor polynomial. We stop at degree n, so this is an n-degree Taylor polynomial, what we've got here. So this is an n-degree Taylor polynomial. And the way we notationally represent it a lot of the times is using the capital letter T and then a subscript to denote what its degree is. So, so what I've written out over here is what we would call T sub n of x, the nth, nth degree Taylor polynomial of f centered at a. Uh, so that's pretty much all there is to it. It's just a, if you know how to find the Taylor series of a function, then you already know how to find all of its Taylor polynomials. So that's why I was saying if you're already pretty comfortable with Taylor series, you shouldn't find these to be much of an obstacle. Uh, one subtlety to note about uh, mainly just terminology. Uh, so when I refer to the n-degree Taylor polynomial and I write uh, T sub n, uh, remember that n is referring to the highest order term that you get. Um, so an n-degree polynomial refers to a polynomial where the highest degree of, oops, excuse me, the highest degree term you get is a power of n. So a third degree 
uh, Taylor polynomial is a cubic, a fourth degree is a quartic, and so on. And so what it does not refer to, so n does not refer or necessarily refer to the number of terms of the series or the number of non-zero terms of the, of the polynomial. As a matter of fact, um, in the most common case where you have no zero terms, where all of these are non-zero, uh, an n-degree Taylor polynomial has n plus one many terms. Uh, but at any rate, just bear that in mind. The n does not refer to number of terms. It just refers to the highest exponent that appears attached to the x. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into an example. So example eight, the task is to find the second and third degree Taylor polynomials uh, for this function for f of x is equal to uh, deja vu cosine of 3x. Uh, ah, but in this case, uh, something a little different. We're going to be centered at x equals pi over 6. All right, so the basic strategy is to uh, more or less just pretend that the question asked us to find the Taylor series expansion of cosine of 3x centered at pi over 6, uh, except the only difference is we're going to stop after we have computed the second and third degree uh, Taylor polynomials. In particular, it means we don't have to actually find the full Taylor series formula, which covers all possible degrees. We only care about going all the way up to the third degree and no higher. Uh, so in this case, since we're centering about uh, x equals pi over 6, um, it may or may not be feasible to try to leverage one of the, uh, to leverage the standard a Taylor series expansion for cosine. Uh, in this case, I'm not really sure. Um, if you're if you're feeling ambitious, you might go and try to see if you can leverage uh, one of the Taylor series we've already got to write um, the Taylor expansion of cosine three x at this center point instead. Uh, but I'm just going to tackle this uh, the old-fashioned way. We're just going to compute uh, a bunch of derivatives. But in this case, all we really need to compute are three derivatives and no more. And we don't have to find a pattern in them. All right, so let's go ahead and start off with, uh, I guess, just the first bit. Let's find the second uh, degree Taylor polynomial. Uh, so in that case, what does it look like, a generic degree two Taylor polynomial? It is f of a. Uh, let me actually be specific in this case. We know what a is. It's uh, pi over six. So we have f of pi over six plus f prime of pi over 6 times x minus pi over 6, and then plus f double prime of pi over 6 divided by 2 factorial, which is actually just 2, times x minus pi over 6 squared. All right, so that's what we're after, and the things we need to fill in are these, um, uh, these function values, so f of pi over 6 and its two derivatives. All right, so let's go ahead and write them out, write out everything we know. So we'll start out with f of pi over 6. So that is just going to be cosine of 3 pi over 6, or in other words, just the cosine of pi over 2. And if my trig knowledge does not abandon me here, that is actually 0. So evidently, this thing has no zero order term, no constant term. All right, very good. So next up, we need the first derivative. We need f prime at pi over 6. All right, so to get that, I need to take one derivative of this thing. So if I take the derivative of that coupled with the chain rule, I think I get negative 3 times the sine of 3x. And in this case, I need to evaluate x at pi over 6. That's what this notation means. It means take this expression involving x and do the substitution. All right, so plug it in. I'm going to get negative 3 times the sine of 3 times that, which is pi over 2. So you get the same 
input to the trig function. And the sine of pi over 2, I think, is 1. So we get that this is just negative 3. All right, so far so good. So we'll do one more. And we get uh, the second derivative evaluated at pi over 6. So I need to take the derivative of this thing. So when I do, I'm going to get another factor of 3 popping out. So I'm going to have a negative 3 squared times the cosine of 3x. Again, evaluated at pi over 6. And so I'm going to have negative 3 squared times the cosine of pi over 2, which, just like before, is going to be 0. All right, so that's actually a bit interesting. Apparently, the uh, degree 2 Taylor polynomial really consists of only one term, just this middle term. Uh, these two terms actually zero out. So as weird as it might kind of look, the second degree Taylor polynomial for cosine 3x at pi over 6 is actually just a linear function. It's negative 3 times the quantity x minus pi over 6. It feels kind of weird to refer to this as a second-degree Taylor polynomial. Um, here's one way that you can kind of uh, make sense of it. So by saying that the second-degree poly Taylor polynomial is linear, what that's saying is the best... Um, that, the, that the linear function actually plays the role... Uh, is actually the best approximation that you get, uh, even taking quadratic possibilities into account. In other words, if you were to go and uh, consider any possible quadratic approximation, ax squared plus bx plus c, where you can pick anything you want in for a, b, and c, the ideal quadratic approximation for f of x, if your center point is pi over 6, is actually to select a equals 0. So that's all that this is really saying, is by saying that, that the degree 2 polynomial is linear, that a quadratic approximation is linear, is to say that the best quadratic approximation involves uh, not doing anything quadratic. That if you add something quadratic, you're just going to make things worse, not better. All right, so we've got the second degree Taylor polynomial. So now it's time for the third degree burn, I mean, Taylor polynomial. Uh, all right, so to get the third degree polynomial, <laughs> Uh, we need one more derivative, right? So we would just keep on continuing the sequence. We have f, f prime, f double prime. We would have one more after that. So I think what would, we would have, if I write it out explicitly, I don't think I'll copy everything down, uh, we'll have all of this stuff, which I will just label as t2 of x, which we've already got right there, plus the third order term, which is going to be f triple prime of pi over 6 divided by 3 factorial, which I think is 6, times x minus pi over 6 cubed. All right, so the only thing I really need is to find out what this, uh, this value is. So let's continue the sequence then. So f triple prime at pi over 6. I need to take a derivative of this thing. So I think that will, uh, that'll get rid of the negative in this case. I'll get another factor of 3, so I have 3 cubed in this case, times positive sine of 3x, and this is evaluated at x equals pi over 6. All right, and actually, let me write it out over here. So that will give me, I think, 3 cubed times the sine of pi over 2. And just like before, sine of pi over 2, that is 1, so we just get 3 cubed, or in other words, 27. All right, so in that case, to fill in our final answer, we get that the third degree polynomial is going to be what we had originally for t2. It's going to be negative 3 times x minus pi over 6, linear. And then we're going to add the uh, third order term. So in this case, uh, that would be, we're going to plug in 27 in for this, so we're going to have 27 divided by 6 times x minus pi over 6 cubed. 
And uh, if you feel like simplifying it, uh, this will actually simplify slightly. 27 over 6, I believe, is 9 over 2. But in any case, there we go. So our third degree Taylor polynomial uh, is actually legitimately a third degree polynomial, which means we can actually make a, a real improvement over the linear if we throw in a cubic term, but we can't make an improvement by adding a quadratic term. All right, so in a similar vein, we have example nine. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the task in this case is to find t2 of x, the second degree uh, Taylor polynomial, for f of x equals x to the 5 fourths power. about x equals 16. Alrighty, so if we want the second order, oh, so I wish it was asking for the first order, then I could say if we want the first order and I could make a Star Wars reference. Oh well, there's always room for sequels. All right, so t2 of x, that is, we remind ourselves that is going to be f of 16 plus f prime of 16 times x minus 16 plus f double prime of 16 over 2 times x minus 16 squared. All right, so the things we need to fill in for are these f values. So first up is just the value of the function at, si at uh, x equals 16. So I plug in 16. I get 16 to the 5 fourths. Uh, so the way I'll do that is I will do the denominator first. So the denominator tells me what root I need to take. So I need to take the fourth root of 16. Uh, that's the same as taking a square root twice. So the square root of 16 is 4. Take another square root, I get 2. So I'm left with 2 to the 5, which is 32. All right, next up, I need f prime of 16. So I need to take the derivative of this thing. So that'll give me a 5 fourths x to the 1 fourth. And I'm evaluating this at x equals 16. So if I plug that in, I just have the fourth root of 16, which I already computed last time was 2. So this is 5 fourths times 2, or in other words, 5 over 2. All right, and one last function I need the second derivative. All right, so I take the derivative of this thing, and I'm going to get, I think, 5 over 16 times x to the negative 3 fourths. And I'm plugging in 16 into that. All right, so I get 5 over 16 times 16 to the negative 3 fourths. Uh, I don't know about you, but my brain does not handle um, computing with negative exponents very well, so I'm going to turn it into a positive exponent via division. So 5 over 16 times 1 over 16 to the 3 fourths power. All right, so take the fourth root and then raise it to the third. All right, so in that case, uh, 4 through to 16, that's 2, and then I cube 2. So I'm going to get an 8, I think. And if I combine those two together, uh, I think that will give me one, uh, 5 over 128. All right, so those are all the pieces I need. So now let's actually write out t2 of x. So we start off with just plain vanilla f of 16, so that's 32, plus f prime, which is 5 over 2 times x minus 16. And then last one is I take this value, uh, divide it by 2, and that gives me my, my coefficient. So if I divide it by 2, that'll give me 5 over 256 times x minus 16 squared.
All right. Actually, one as one uh, one little side note. Uh, something I've always found a little bit interesting about Taylor series, especially in the context of dealing with functions like this, is it's something's kind of weird is going on. I feel like um, because. What we're really doing here, I mean, we didn't we didn't go through the whole process, but uh, that but if we kept on going for higher and higher order Taylor polynomials, we could in principle get a Taylor series representation of x to the five over four, so some sort of polyno of some sort of infinitely long polynomial that equals x to the five over four at x equals sixteen, and that to me feels philosophically a little weird um, because x to the five over four is almost kind of a polynomial, isn't it? Um, in fact, its, deg its degree, if you were to think about it as a polynomial, it's, it's not a polynomial, but if you were to imagine it as being one, it would be a polynomial of degree five over four or degree 1.25. So it's a quarter of the way uh, along the path of, be of uh, between being a linear and a quadratic. It's part way through the process. It's part way through, or it's part way between being a linear and a quadratic. And yet the weird thing is, I mean, you can even see it evidenced here, is this thing is in some sense weaker than a quadratic. It, it's a lower degree than a quadratic. And yet to approximate it well with a Taylor series, we need a quadratic term. In fact, we could keep on going. We would get cubics and quartics and degree 100 terms and whatever. And so it just feels a little bit strange. I mean, it works. There's nothing actually wrong here. But I find it interesting to note that um, a power function like x to the 5 fourths, which is a very close cousin to just a plain vanilla polynomial, can actually be approximated by polynomials of degrees that are way bigger than 5 fourths. Adding a degree 100 polynomial, along with all of the 99 that are below it, helps you approach this function, which only has a degree 5 fourths, so to speak. So, I don't know, I find that weird. You need really high order terms in order to equal a function which, in some sense, has a much lower degree. I don't know, kind of weird. All right, but moving on, I have one final example for you guys. Example 10. So in this case, we are looking for the third degree Taylor polynomial. for the function f of x equals x e to the x. And in this case, we are centered at x equals 5. All right, so this one I'm pretty sure you could actually do by uh, making use of the Taylor, the Maclaurin expansion for just plain vanilla e to the x. Uh, you could actually get this. Uh, a full-blown Taylor series expansion for x e to the x that way. Uh, pretty sure you can do it. Uh, I have not done it. I was trying to do it, and it looked like it was becoming a little bit uh, cumbersome. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's something you could do if you really wanted to. Uh, but it was a little bit of an algebra torture. So, uh, so I'm just going to do this the direct way, because again, this is just a measly third-degree polynomial. I just need to compute three derivatives should not be too bad. All right, so we need, so we're ultimately interested in t3 of x. Uh, in order to get that, we need four values of the function. We need the value of the function at five and for its uh, three derivatives. So we'll start off with f of five, as we always do, the zeroth derivative. Uh, so just plug in five, I get five e to the five. All right, very good. Okay, next derivative, uh, f prime of x. Uh, so I need to take the derivative of this. That is going to involve a product rule, I think. So I'm going to take the derivative of the first factor and leave the second alone to start. So that'll just give me e to the x. And then I add the version where I take the derivative of the other factor. So take the derivative of e to the x. Uh, well, that just leaves it unchanged. It's just e to the x. All right, so that's my... Uh, derivative, although I actually want to evaluate it at 5. All right, that's not too hard to do. Just plug in 5, we get e to the 5 plus 5e to the 5. 
uh, which I guess is 6e to the 5. All right, next one up. We need the second derivative. All right, so I have to take the derivative of two things. So first off, uh, derivative of e to the x is just itself, nothing changes. Uh, then I have to take the derivative of this, and I've actually already done that. The derivative of x e to the x is actually the entire expression right here that I've written. So actually, uh, I don't need to go through the trouble again. I will just copy-paste for this guy's derivative what I've already got. So it's plus another e to the x plus x e to the x. Or in other words, if I condense it a little bit, that is 2e to the x plus x e to the x, evaluated at x equals 5. All right, so I plug that in, and I'm going to get 2e to the 5 plus 5e to the 5. Or in other words, uh, 7e to the 5. All right, and I need only one more derivative after that. So I think you can see what's going to happen here. If I take the derivative of this, it's unchanged. And if I take the derivative of this, it's also unchanged, except I get an additional term of e to the x popping out. So what I'm going to wind up getting is a 3e to the x plus xe to the x evaluated at x equals 5. And plugging that in, we get 3e to the 5 plus 5e to the 5, which is 8e to the 5. All right, so let me go ahead and highlight these. These are my four function values. So now let's actually put them in their place. Bad function values, bad function values. Put you in your place. All right, so we're gonna start off with f of five. That is five e to the five. Next up, uh, we put in the derivative. So that is in this case, six e to the five, and I multiply by x minus five. Second order term, I put in this piece, 7e to the 5, but I have to remember I need to divide by 2 factorial, or in other words, just 2. And then I multiply by x minus 5 squared. And the last piece is 8e to the 5, but I have to remember I need to divide by 3 factorial, which is 6. And that thing times x minus 5 cubed. And there we have it.